Okay, so, you'll forgive me. I'm, I came fully prepared and I had fully intended to get into our study of Romans today. However, it sort of dawned on me yesterday uh, when I was, you know, updating the update because of how fast moving everything is. Uh, and then this morning it was sort of confirmed when I, there was even more that needed to be sort of, you know, more dots needed to be connected, more blanks needed to be filled in. Uh, I made the decision today to not even try to rush through it and get into Romans. Now, Lord willing, next week we will complete Romans chapter 14. Uh, so uh, please uh, forgive me if you uh, were really looking forward to um, being convicted about your narcissism and individualism and <laughs> the lastism, which I'm not going to tell you until you uh, come next week and you'll find out. Um, now I want to also do something a little bit different today in, in our Prophecy Update. I want to begin by sharing with you an email that we received from a YouTube subscriber uh, just this last week. And the reason I'm doing this is because this is really one of the main reasons that we've been doing these prophecy updates week in and week out for the last seven years now. We started this back in 2006 when the Lord had impressed it upon my heart that we were nearing the end and the hour was at hand, the time was at hand, and it was time to begin talking about Bible prophecy because our redemption was drawing nigh. Um, let me just uh, share with you uh, what she wrote, or what, this is a he actually, I can't pronounce his name and I feel real bad about that. He says, I'm from Dallas, Texas. My family is a non-denominational, is non-denominational, and have always wanted me to get close to God. I was never not wanting to get close to God, but it seems there are a lot of religions these days and a lot of people who claim to know the Word and live by the Word. Therefore, I was kind of shy and scared to follow anyone. Then I found you. I have been listening to every Sunday episode I can, and I look forward to the, the one this Sunday. I love following you and listening to you. I feel like my journey following you has become a major step towards making my life eternal in heaven with the Lord. Thank you for making it so easy to follow your teachings. P.S. Here is something I found. You start off saying in every Sunday teaching that in the end days people will be mocking Jesus Christ. It's funny that I always hear this and then I look at, then look at what I found. The new Kane West CD. Uh, I've heard of him. I, I, I guess he's a, a popular uh, musician. Uh, the new Kane West CD entitled Jesus. Uh, it doesn't get more evil. This guy is depicting himself as Jesus on the front cover. Uh, just decided to email you and let you know maybe some ammo for you to include in the next service. Uh, thanks, JD, for helping my lost, evil, flesh spirit, I like that, find the Lord and be born again. So we praise God and rejoice. We know that the ministry here in this small, obscure church is reaching to the uttermost parts of the earth. I also want to share with you this one. This one really touched my heart. Uh, came uh, yesterday from um, a uh, family in Johnson City, Tennessee. Dear Pastor J.D., encloses a money order for $50 for the church. It's all my son had to give and he wanted you to use it for the glory of God. He watches you all the time and is learning from you. He said he can understand the word the way you present it. My son has Asperger's and is considered delayed, but he loves the Lord and is eager for Christ's return. You have touched his life and the church is very important to him. This money order represents his saving of his change. It's all he has, but use it for the church, please. My son had seizures that God healed him from. He believes, as do I, that the Lord is near. 
Thank you for presenting the scripture in a way that is engaging and easy to comprehend. Blessings to your family and the brothers and sisters at Calvary Chapel Kaneohe. That's you. <laughs> if we lived in Hawaii, we'd be members there. <laughs> you sort of already are, by proxy. Uh, in our hearts, though we are, until we meet on the other side of Jordan, all our love and support. Love, Ethan, Ray, and Brooke. <sighs> Listen, this is fruit added to your account as a body of believers, and I just wanted to share that with you for a number of reasons, chief of which is that these Bible prophecy updates are not just simply so that we can know or be in the know and be ready for the Lord's soon return, but I think furthermore, they are an encouragement. It's for this reason that the Apostle Paul would write to the church in Thessalonica and say that in the context of the rapture encouraging the Thessalonica Christians that they could encourage one another with these words in God's word and God has given us his word that he is coming soon and very soon. You know, I know that a lot of us are going through many difficulties, going through that dark anguish of the night that we talked about on Thursday night, that deep anguish of the soul, that dark night of the soul. But when it comes to Bible prophecy, it gives you that much needed perspective that, hey, this is as bad as it gets. And th this is really uh, not even on the same, in the same universe to be compared with the glory that awaits. It's in fact criminal, the Apostle Paul would say, to try to compare the sufferings of this life with the glory that awaits. Bible prophecy sort of refocuses us and calibrates us and gets our minds on him, our hearts after him, and it loosens our grip on this world and the things of this world that we might focus our attention on the world to come. Think about what James said. He said, our lives here are like a vapor. And I think that Satan, for this reason, tries to get us so focused on and distracted by this life, the cares and the affairs of this life. And his strategy is very simple. It's uh, very powerful, though, but it's by doing that, he gets our focus off of eternal life. So we're not heavenly minded. See, when I know that I have this to look forward to, it makes whatever I'm going through easier to get through because this is not how it ends. <laughs> this is not how it ends. God will have the final word. Would you join with me in a word of prayer and we'll get started. <sighs> Loving Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the more sure word of prophecy. It's that certainty that we need in the midst of a world riddled with uncertainty. Lord, we don't know what the future holds for us as your bride until you come for us. But we do know that you hold our future for us as your bride before you come for us. Lord, I pray that our Bible prophecy studies will be such that they become a great encouragement for many who just need to be encouraged by the nearness of your return for us to take us out of this sick and evil and dying and Christ-rejecting world. Lord, come quickly. Maranatha. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, for today, we'll look at our ninth reason. We started this a number of weeks ago. We're looking at a number of reasons as to why it is that we believe the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ may in fact be closer than any of us even realize. Uh, I'm hoping you'll bear with me as I... Uh, sort of update a few of the first eight. Uh, we began with Second Peter chapter 3. 
Uh, this is the prophecy concerning the increase of scoffers and mockers of Christ's return and those who believe in it and would even dare to talk about it. The second reason is the absence, sadly, of the United States of America from the pages of Bible prophecy, which many believe, present company included, comes vis-a-vis -vis the collapse, or as Joel Rosenberg in one of his books titled The Implosion of the United States of America. In other words, the absence of the United States of America from Bible prophecy could reasonably be explained by the con complete and total collapse and implosion of this once greatest nation on planet Earth. And would you agree that we are even now in real time beginning to see this come to pass? I mean, personally, if I could just be so candid, I'm of the opinion that we as a nation have crossed the line. I, I believe that we're now past the point of no return, and here's why. I don't know how we recover as a nation amidst the enormity of the scandals that were seemingly revealed every single day. And it's not just these scandals in and of themselves, it's all of these scandals collectively close in proximity one to the other. They all point to a very uh, clear scenario of what it's going to be like in the seven-year tribulation. I was listening to a, uh, an expert on the NSA, uh, you know, data gathering uh, through the, you know, phones and emails and so forth. Well, it's come to light that they're building this colossal uh, one million square foot facility in Utah and it's going to be totally devoted to gathering and collecting and saving data. It's an NSA data collection, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, building or buildings. It's just enormous. And so one commentator suggested that um, in and of itself it's not so much uh, something that he's necessarily concerned with, but he said this most interestingly, he said, what really concerns me is that in the wrong hands, we could overnight become a policed state. That's where it's heading. And when he said that, oh my goodness, <laughs> I, just, I just thought, you know not what you say. You have no idea what you just said because what you just said is what the Bible has said all along is that there's going to come a man, this man of perdition, the Antichrist in place of Christ and when he comes on the scene he's going to control the entire world. Perfect. Everything is being set up. You know, one of the most interesting prophecies concerning the Antichrist is that he doesn't set it all up. All the wiring is being, you know, wired in the conduit, you'll pardon the pun, and everything is being ready, so all he has to do when he's unveiled, which he can't be unveiled until we're removed, but when he's unveiled, all he does is flip on the switch to a one-world government and a one-world religion and a one-world economy. And that's the common denominator in everything that is happening supremely in this country. Now, please don't misunderstand me. While I believe that we have crossed the line as a nation, and it's too late in the sense that we've passed the point of no return, I'm not saying that it's too late for the non-believing souls in America. I believe that people are starting to wake up, and we're starting to see little rumblings of it. People are starting to realize, wait a minute wait a minute, something's not right here. This, this sounds like something I remember in, in Sunday school when I was a kid or when I was, you know, drugged to church. Maybe literally I was given drugs to go to church and I would sit there and listen to this pastor talk about the end times and 
And this is starting to sound a lot like that. And so I think people are starting to wake up in this country. So I don't think it's too late for that. I just think it's too late for the non-repentant soul of America, not the non-believing souls in America. I, I hope, I believe, and love hopes all things. I hope that God is just going to do a work and move in the hearts of people in this country that there would be an awakening and that they would come to Christ before it's too late. That's my prayer. That's my hope. And I think you share that as well. Our third reason, very disturbing, it's this blind acceptance of Islam as a peace-loving religion, chiefly in this nation under the banner of political correctness. And now we're seeing it sort of spread, which is the sole goal of Islam. Islam meaning submission. It's to get the whole world into submission to the worship of Allah and his prophet Muhammad. And we're seeing it now sweeping across the world. It's this fourth reason that I think requires some time to update, especially given the prophecy concerning both Egypt in Isaiah 19 and Syria in Isaiah 17. These two prophecies to me are specifically the most dramatic in terms of how we're seeing them fulfilled in real time, particularly Egypt because Isaiah 19 began to be fulfilled the first verse, few verses, the first three verses really, when they had their uprising, their quote-unquote Arab Spring, Egyptian rising up against Egyptian and brother against brother. And then the cruel master that they would be given over to was when uh, Mohammed Mursi, the uh, Muslim Brotherhood president, was elected. And so then after that, we have more prophecies that are now on the table and beginning to come to pass. Just this last week, the cup of these two Isaiah prophecies were filled even more with the breaking news coming out of both of those countries seemingly on a daily basis and in some cases even an hourly basis. Let's uh, first tackle Egypt. It seems that Ethiopia has... Uh, read the prophecy in Isaiah 19 uh, concerning the Nile. Remember we talked about the drying up of the Nile? It's already drying up, but apparently Ethiopia realizes that they can actually speed up this prophecy a little bit more, uh, especially from verses 5 through 10. You can follow along or turn there as I read it. It says, Isaiah 19, verse 5, The waters will fail from the sea, and the river will be wasted and dried up. The rivers will turn foul. The brooks of defense will be emptied and dried up. The reeds and rushes will wither. Verse 7, The papyrus reeds by the river, by the mouth of the river, and everything sown by the river will wither, be driven away, and be no more. The fishermen, verse 8, also will mourn. All those will lament who cast hooks into the river, and they will languish who spread nets on the waters. Moreover, verse 9, those who work in fine flax and those who weave fine fabric will be ashamed. And, verse 10, its foundations will be broken. All who make wages will be troubled of soul. Incidentally, uh, the Nile River is the Egyptians' livelihood. Um, you know, hear me out for a second here. I, I was thinking about this on the way here this morning. You know what, and I'm as guilty as the next guy, probably more so, but when, when you get into the nuts and bolts of prophecy, sometimes you have this tendency to dehumanize it. And what I, what I mean by that is, these are real people. Actually, they're my people. These are fellow Arabs, fellow Egyptians, fellow countrymen of mine, and this is their livelihood. This is how they make a living. So, yes, it's Bible prophecy being fulfilled, but these are the lives of real people for whom Jesus Christ died. 
please pray. I know that at the end of Isaiah 19, it ends good for the Egyptians because they come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, the God of Israel, the Savior of the world. That's at the end, but it's going to get a whole lot worse before it gets better. Please pray for the Egyptian people. Please pray for the Syrian people. The totals now, arguably conservative, are reaching well nigh 100,000 Syrians since this whole thing began. Just to put it into perspective, that would be the equivalent approximately of the population of both Kaneohe and Kailua. You've wiped out virtually the entire windward side of Oahu. That's how many people have died in this Syria uprising and this war. Uh, I want to share with you this Washington Post article. It really, I think, captured the intensity of really what's going on there. The headline read, Egypt frets, fumes over Ethiopia's Nile plan. Let me just read a, a portion of what they published in this article out of Giza, which is where my aunt lives, actually, uh, next to the pyramids there. Uh, here's what they uh, had to say. Since long before the pyramids towered above the rich soil of this riverside town, Egyptians have given thanks to the muddy waters of the Nile. Plants, animals, humans, said Ibrahim Abdel Aziz, a 45-year-old farmer. We all come from this river. Well, not exactly, but uh, there in the Othi Ethiopian highlands, one of the world's largest dams is taking shape. For Ethiopia, the dam promises abundant energy and an escape from a seemingly permanent spot in the lowest rungs of the world's human development index. But for Egypt, the consequences could be dire for a country facing daily domestic crises in the aftermath of its 2011 revolution. The dam is a foreign threat that Egypt can ill afford, and that may be the point. Analysts say Ethiopia is seizing on Egypt's distraction and relative fragility to plunge ahead with plans that have long been on the drawing board but have always been thwarted by Egy Egyptian resistance. If that weren't bad enough for Egypt, <laughs> it was about to get even worse when during a meeting, and I think this took place in Egypt on Thursday, it was a meeting to discuss ways in Egypt to stop Ethiopia from building this dam. Uh, the chairman of the Islamic Labor Party, Magdi Ahmed Hussein, was exposed by a hot mic that he knew was on, he just didn't know that it was being broadcast live. <laughs> it turns out, uh, as he thought the meeting was secret, it was actually, perhaps providentially, being broadcast on live TV via Memory TV, a Middle East television network. Now, what follows is some of what he had to say thinking he was speaking only to those in this secret meeting, most of whom were suggesting that Ethiopia's Nile River Dam project was in fact a secret American and Israeli plot to undermine Egypt. Now listen to what he had to say, quote, I'm very fond of battles, with the enemies of course, with America and Israel. <laughs> Excuse me? Didn't uh, John Kerry and the uh, administration just give them something like, I don't know, a billion dollars or a jillion dollars or something? He says, this battle must be waged with maximum judiciousness and calm. Even though this is a secret meeting, we must all take an oath not to leak anything to the media. <laughs> It's at this point that he's handed a note informing him that he shouldn't really worry about leaking it to the media because the media was broadcasting it live, much to his astonishment. <laughs> Upon learning this, he nervously laughs, then says, Okay, fine. Uh, the principles behind what I'm saying are not really secret. Our, 
Our war is with America and Israel. And he knows now that it's being broadcast live for all the world to hear. He says our war is with America and Israel, not with Ethiopia. I'm not presenting a secret plan or anything. All the countries do what I am saying and what has been said by, by others. All countries with regional conflicts do that. I say to the, Ethi uh, to the Egyptian people, listen to this, nobody can turn off your water supply unless they want to turn the Egyptians into the world's most extremist people. Imagine what this people would do if its water were turned off with all 80 million of us would do to Israel and America if our water is turned off. Now, put this Ethiopia, Egypt scenario in your hip pocket because it's going to come back into play. Some of you already know where I'm going with it, but interesting that Ethiopia is in Ezekiel 38 and Egypt is not. Okay. In concert with upping the ante on Isaiah 19 concerning Egypt, it's also been upped on Isaiah 17 concerning Syria and the quote-unquote rebel forces. Just yesterday Fox News confirmed that the US will now supply these unknown Syrian rebels with weapons through a CIA run program. Does that bring you great comfort knowing that it's going to be run through the CIA? Now I say unknown because it's unknown. It's unknown how that these rebels, and they're not going to tell us this, but I believe these rebels are in all likelihood the Muslim Brotherhood attempting, as Al-Qaeda is calling for, attempting to set up a caliphate, an Islamic caliphate, in order to wage war on Israel. If you look at a map, Syria is key geographically and significant prophetically when it comes to the entire world attacking Israel as God's chosen people. We'll come back to that here shortly. Um, updating those prophecies brings us to the fifth reason that we believe the rapture is closer than any of us realize. It's found in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 5. It's the prophecy about the perilous times of moral decay within the church. Not just in the world, but in the church, which would mark these as the last days. And then this dovetailed into our sixth reason, which is found in the next chapter of 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, which is a prophecy concerning the perilous times of not just moral decay, but spiritual decay within the church, which would also be a marker that we were living in the last days. Then we looked at our seventh reason found in Luke's Gospel 17, verses 26 through 30. It's a prophecy from the Savior himself, and it's how that we're clearly living in a day that would parallel Noah's day and the days of Lot as well. There are so many, it's a study unto itself, just the population of the earth is similar in our day as it was in Noah's day. Signs in the sun and the moon in the sky similar in Noah's day as in our day. The fascination with aliens by the way. Noah's day, same as our day as well. Two weeks ago we looked at our eighth reason which is the profound increase of knowledge across the board really. Not just technologically but biblically in that the time of the end has come and the seal is broken and now that knowledge will be increased as prophesied in Daniel 12 verse 4. Then last week we looked at our ninth reason which is the swiftness with which just one facet of Ezekiel 38 Ezekiel 38 is multifaceted and we're sure to revisit it at a time yet future but just this one facet, the, the role of Turkey in Ezekiel 38 and how that it's all coming together. 
so swiftly, so rapidly, so perfectly. And Turkey is very key prophetically. And interestingly, there's all of a sudden now an uprising, though could arguably be for different reasons. They're protesting the Islamic Sharia law in Turkey that Erdogan has changed their country from a secular country which by the way not long ago was an ally of Israel if you can imagine that and so it's this hardline Islamic Sharia law and they're seeing their country now submitting to Islam and that's why they're protesting interesting uh, is it just me or do the protests in Turkey's Taksim Square as pictured here bear an eerie resemblance to the prior protests in Egypt's Tahrir Square? I mean, this is a movement of foot. You know, it's interesting in Revelation 20, I can't remember off the top of my head the verse, but it says that Satan knoweth he hath but a short time. Actually, it might be 12. <laughs> forgive me. It's either Revelation 12 or Revelation 20. I should probably get that right before second service. Um, but it says, Satan knoweth he hath but a short time. It's almost like Satan is really getting busy. He knows he's running short on time. And if he's going to do what we are told he's going to do, he better get with it. And he is. He's on it. He's on it. And he's in it. Now, the reason I point this out is because Egypt and Syria are conspicuously absent from Ezekiel 38, but Turkey and Ethiopia are in Ezekiel 38. Now, here's what I'm thinking. It would seem to indicate that Isaiah 17, concerning the destruction becoming a ruinous heap of Damascus, and Isaiah 19, the complete devastation and decimation of Egypt will likely be fulfilled prior to the prophecy in Ezekiel 38, which I still believe, I'm not dogmatic about it, but I believe that the Ezekiel 38 prophecy will take place after the rapture and at the beginning of the seven-year tribulation. And the reason I believe that is because it says that they, there are so many details in this multifaceted prophecy that Israel dwells safely. She's brought down her walls with the bars and the gates, the ones that were erected in the first intifada in the year 2000. So in other words, there must have been a peace agreement. Well, there can't be a peace agreement unless the Antichrist confirms that covenant and enforces it. And the Antichrist can't be on the scene enforcing that peace agreement that makes Israel think she dwells safely until the church has been removed. So in other words, if we're seeing things already coming to pass, beginning to be fulfilled that will not ultimately be fulfilled until the tribulation be being fulfilled now, how close is the rapture? Listen, my week in and week out, standing up here before this wonderful church talking about why it is that we believe the rapture is closer than any of us might realize, it's not arbitrary. <laughs> this is why. This is why. I mean, God doesn't want us ignorant concerning Bible prophecy. This is why he told us what's going to happen before it happens, so when it happens, we would believe. That's John 14, 29. Okay, well, let's, that was the introduction. So uh, now you know why we're not going into Romans today. Here's our tenth reason. It's the lateness of the hour on God's prophetic clock, Israel, since being reborn as a nation in one day, by one vote, by the way, in the UN, May 14th, 1948. I'm going to take it a step further and suggest that this particular prophecy is actually the litmus test by which we can know that we are the last generation who will be alive to see the coming of the Son of Man. I'll uh, expound on that in a moment, but first I want us to look at the 
first prophecy, really the main prophecy concerning the rebirth of the nation of Israel. It's in the Old Testament book of Ezekiel who records how God will bring to life the dead and dry bones and return Israel back to their homeland. Let me just read it quickly. It's verses 11 through 14 of interesting Ezekiel chapter 37. Now I know this is going to be deeply profound, but stay with me. What comes after 37? Ezekiel 38. I told you that was going to be deeply profound, but in other words, <laughs> the prophecy concerning them returning to the land, Ezekiel 37, comes prior to the prophecy about them being attacked once they return to the land in the next chapter. Uh, okay, I think you got it. Verse 11, then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, O oh, my people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, verse 13, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live. And I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. Ah, I love it. I love Ezekiel 37 and 38 too. I'm of the belief that Jesus is sort of echoing the Ezekiel prophecy when in a parable he teaches that the final generation that sees the leaves come back to the fig tree would be the same generation just as the same generation that saw life come back to the dead bones. It's in Mark's Gospel, the 13th chapter, beginning in verse 28, I'll read. Now learn, that I love to hear the sound of your Bible pages just, uh, I also like to hear the sounds of your iPads uh, going to that too. I love that sound too. Actually, I love that more, but that's just me. Mark 13, beginning in verse 28. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, verse 30. Listen. This generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. No one knows about the day or hour. Is that a familiar metaphor? No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, verse 33. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. You can know that that time is near by virtue of the leaves returning to the tree. By the way, the fig, uh, is the, the fig tree is the national symbol of Israel, like the bald eagle is the national symbol of the United States of America. So just as life will come to those dead bones, so too, and the leaves coming back to that dead tree, so too will the Jew come back to their land and be reborn as a nation. Now, this begs the question that has sort of baffled many a Bible prophecy teacher, and perhaps by God's design, but the question is, okay, so the generation that's alive to see the rebirth of the nation of Israel will be the generation that sees the coming of the Son of Man? How many years are in a generation? Because I want to start doing the math. <laughs> How many of, you, of us, you know, let's be honest, have done the math, tried to figure it out? Well, we can't know the day or the hour. We can know the year. <laughs> Stop that. Just don't do that. <laughs> it's close. <laughs> it's close. <laughs> now, some believe it's 40 years in a generation. Others say 70. There's even a camp that says there's 100 years 
in a generation. And then, in addition to that, there's the question of the, or when the number actually started counting, when the clock started ticking, when the number of years in a generation actually started. Now, some say the clock started ticking on May 14th, 1948, when Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion raised the Israeli flag, proclaiming Israel's sovereignty as a nation. Uh, others say the clock started ticking in June of 1967 when Israel, in the miraculous six-day war, recaptured Jerusalem, their eternal capital. Now, whether it started in May of 48 or June of 67, we can still know that we're close by virtue of subsequent prophecies that are close in proximity to these other prophecies. Psalm 83 is one such prophecy for telling how once back in the land, like Ezekiel 38, Israel's enemies will declare she has no right to exist. She's occupying the territory. And in so doing, they will seek to wipe her off the map. Make no mistake about it. Everything we're seeing happening in the Middle East and here at home in the United States is all satanically inspired to attempt to destroy Israel, God's chosen people. I want to come back to that as well here in just a moment. Let me just read verses 3 and 4 because there's something I want to point out here in Psalm 83. With cunning, the psalmist writes, verse 3, they conspire against your people, your people, God. They plot against those you cherish. Come, they say, let us destroy them as a nation, not a state. The psalmist doesn't prophesy, let us destroy them as a state. No, when God said to Abraham, I'm going to make you a great state, you know, like California or Texas, actually, I'll make you a great state. No, I'm going to make you a great nation. Nation. That the name of Israel be remembered no more. Interestingly, on October 26th, 2005, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad was quoted as saying almost verbatim what Psalm 83 says, as the Imam said, Israel must be wiped off the map. You know what's really interesting is that yesterday in Iran, or actually it was on Friday in Iran, they had their presidential uh, elections. Bye bye Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Uh, See ya, <laughs> wouldn't want to be ya. The results came yesterday that one Hassan Rouhani would succeed Ahmadinejad as the president of Iran. But don't get too excited about the notion of this demon-possessed Ahmadinejad fading into the backdrop of obscurity. Why? Because Khamenei is the puppet master and he pulls the strings in order to usher in the 12th Imam. I was sort of stunned by the many news reports touting this newly elected president of Iran as being a quote-unquote moderate. Really? Listen, I might be stupid, but I'm not that stupid. Listen, it doesn't matter moderate or not. It does not matter. It's the Khamenei who is commissioned, he believes, and called to usher in their Muslim Messiah who will, according to the writings of the Hadith, Islamists' holy book, the Hadith, that this man, this Imam, this Messiah will rule and reign where? In Jerusalem. For how long? Oh, seven years? Seven years? In Jerusalem? He's a puppet. This is not a game changer at all. Also, just this morning, Joel Rosenberg, of whom I'm a great fan, tweeted a breaking news story out of the UK which reported that Iran will send 4,000 troops to aid President Assad in Syria against the 
rebel forces whom apparently we're now going to support. Now, why is that significant? Because, oh my goodness, is the time almost done? Don't look at your watches. You just look at your watches. Don't do that. <laughs> Russia and Iran have made it very clear in no uncertain terms that they are explicitly behind the support of Assad and against these quote-unquote Syrian rebels. This is huge. It's huge. I, I don't have the time to tell you how huge it is. Interesting. On the heels of this, also breaking, was that Egypt's Mohammed Mursi is cutting ties and pulling their embassy out of Syria, not in support of Assad, but in support of the rebel forces. <laughs> we in Egypt, we're like this. And Russia and Iran, they're on the other side of this war. Uh, I think you know this is going to be another reason at a future update as to why it is, but oh my goodness. Back to our Psalm 83 prophecy. Psalm 83, for me, is the one that seals the deal. And here's why. I'll pose in a form of a question. Why Israel? Why is the whole world now against Israel, surrounding Israel? Why not Brazil? I'm, ju I'm just asking. I I'm not trying to be cute. I mean, why is it Israel and not Brazil or some other country? Could it be that from the very beginning, Satan has sought to annihilate God's chosen people because of who, as a Jew, was yet to come? Stay with me on this. I would submit Satan, starting with Abel, has tried to thwart the coming of the seed of the woman who would crush his head. This is in Genesis 3.15. It's also known as the Proto-Evangelicum. It's a fancy uh, Bible seminary word for uh, the gospel in advance. Listen, and I, God says, will put enmity between you, Lucifer, and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He, speaking of the Savior, Jesus, the Messiah, will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Uh, incidentally, uh, this goes on to talk about the seed of the woman in other translations will render it as such. Women don't have seeds, they have eggs. The man has the seed that fertilizes the egg. This is the virgin birth being foretold and prophesied. Now see, Satan is not omniscient, he's not all-knowing. So he doesn't know from whom this Savior, this Christ, is going to come. He thought it was going to come through the line of Abel, so he possessed Cain to kill Abel. Came from Seth. So then you fast forward the clock, as it were, and he tried to annihilate and exterminate and eliminate the Jewish people, God's chosen people, the Jew, Israel. Why? Because if he could have succeeded, he'll never succeed, but if he could have succeeded, he could have thwarted the first coming. And when he failed at thwarting the first coming by having Pharaoh, inspiring and, and possessing Pharaoh satanically to have all of the Hebrew male children put into the Nile to their certain death, save Moses, a type of Christ. And then when that didn't succeed, he possessed demonically another man by the name of Haman. Ask Esther about this one and Mordechai to get the king to issue an edict to exterminate and eliminate and annihilate the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, and he failed. Fast forward to the New Testament. He demonically possessed Herod to kill all the Jewish boys so as to eliminate them completely and, and terminate them completely fast forward to the last century. Hitler 
You notice how they all start with H? Haman, Harod, Hitler. Just saying. I just had to throw that in. just want to make sure because I didn't want you to notice that I'm going over just a little bit. Um, but uh, how about Hitler? Demonically possessed to eliminate, annihilate, exterminate all the Jews. Why? Because if, hypothetically, he was able to succeed, he could have, if not thwarted the first coming of the Christ, he could try to thwart the second coming of the Christ. And he's going to try again in the seven-year tribulation, even now, is postured to do so. Why? Because at the end of the tribulation, the whole house of Israel will get saved. And in so doing, they will call upon their Savior, whom they wounded and pierced. See, Satan knows the scriptures better than we do. He's not all-knowing, <laughs> but he's better knowing than we are. And that's the why behind the what. And to me, that seals the deal because it validates that the God of Israel is real. Did you catch that? God of Israel. Never mind. And maybe second service will be more amenable to that one. By the way, try as he may, Satan and all his demon-possessed men like Hitler prior, they'll never succeed in exterminating Israel as a nation. Listen to Jeremiah 31, verses 35 and 36. This is what the Lord says. He who appoints the sun to shine by day, who decrees the moon and stars to shine by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar, the Lord Almighty is his name. Only if these decrees vanish from my sight, declares the Lord, will the descendants of Israel ever cease to be a nation before me. In other words, before Israel will ever cease to be a nation, the sun will have to cease to shine, the moon will have to cease to be, and the waves, those Hawaiian 10-foot waves, will cease <laughs> to roar. That, and they're never going to cease. So too will Israel never cease to be a nation. Nation, not a state before me. <laughs> nation. Are we okay with that? All right, good. I can move on now. God's word through the prophet Jeremiah will in no way be a deterrent to all the enemies of Israel who at this very moment stand at the ready to destroy her. In addition to Psalm 83, and I'll move very quickly, please bear with me, there are also those close in proximity to Israel, both geographically and genetically, the surrounding people who will attack Israel and we're told will also, I hope that's not a predator drone, <laughs> will all, all attack Israel besieging Judah. This is Zechariah 12 verses 1 through 3. This is the word of the Lord concerning Israel. The Lord who stretches out the heavens, who lays the foundation of the earth, and who forms the spirit of man within him, declares, I am going to make Jerusalem, not Tokyo, not New York, not Paris. I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup that sends all the surrounding peoples reeling. Judah will be besieged, as well as Jerusalem, on that day when all the nations of the earth are gathered against her, and they are even now today gathered against her, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock for all the nations. All who try to move it will injure themselves. So don't even think about trying to move the borders of Jerusalem to facilitate your satanic two-state solution. Israel is not a state Israel is a nation, and there's no such thing as a Palestinian state. Okay, I'm going to close now, so <laughs> hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I want to share with you a portion of a most interesting message from a Facebook friend by the name of Melissa. She writes, Hi, Pastor J.D. I've been listening to each of your messages for quite some time now. I look forward to hearing each and every one of them. That being said, I have a question. As I was trying to connect some dots today, I began again with reading Psalm 83. Herein lies my question. Why does this have to be a war? What am I missing? Am I seeing this as something that is, I'm seeing this as something that is occurring right now as we speak. When I read this, I don't necessarily see a war, but rather a coming against Israel by all those surrounding her. Is it possible 
that this is being fulfilled right now and is a precursor to Ezekiel 38 and 39. And if this is so, then we may in fact be closer to the rapture than any of us realize. <laughs> okay, I stole that from you. <laughs> Steal away, sister. Also, concerning Isaiah 17 and 19, I'm wondering where it states that this is also, this also has to be a war. All in all, Syria, Damascus, may not need to have a war at all to destruct. In fact, they are self-destructing right now as we speak. Furthermore, do you see anything in Isaiah that may indicate the rapture? I may be way off now, but I was thinking that Isaiah 17 verses 4 through 6 may be a picture of the rapture. I'm running out of room in this message. I feel your pain, sister. So I won't quote it, but I feel like it could be speaking of the rapture when it speaks of the harvesting the corn and maybe the gleaning grapes left in verse 6 are the 144,000 who will be left to feed those who will turn to Christ in the tribulation. You know why I share this with you? Because this tells me that I don't have to do as much research anymore. I can just read here. <laughs> you guys are so well taught. You're so on it. I love this. This is great. Absolutely, I believe that it would not necessarily mean there has to be a war. I had one, uh, this is a while back, suggest that the Isaiah 17 prophecy concerning Damascus becoming a ruinous heap would not come vis-a-vis -vis Israel. Rather, it would come vis-a-vis -vis an earthquake. That would do it. That would do it. So, you know, in other words, you know, let's uh, maybe just, you know, kind of take another look at this thing. And, and uh, now, if that's the case, and it very well could be, that there's not necessarily this full-on all-out war. Rather, these prophecies are fulfilled just even now because they're even now being fulfilled. Well, that means it's even closer. That means it's even closer. Maybe there isn't going to be a war. Maybe it's just a matter of time before these prophecies are fulfilled. Okay, lastly, I'm simply going to say, this is yet one more reason, and even more so, a major reason, among the others, as to why it is that I, with all my heart, and I think you with me, believe the rapture is closer than any of us may even realize. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I implore you to call upon Him this day, confessing with your mouth, believing in your heart. And so now we'll get into Romans not the study, <laughs> but the chapter, verse 9. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If you don't know Jesus Christ today, you need to know Jesus Christ today because tomorrow is not promised. Would you please stand? Father, thank you. Thank you for the encouragement for us as believers who have been walking with you for many years, some of us. Thank you that Bible prophecy has the effect of causing us to purify ourselves and be encouraged and be ready for your soon return. And Lord, thank you too that Bible prophecy was given so that people would see how that you told us in your word what would happen in the Middle East and even here at home in the United States long before it would begin to happen so that when it did happen, or at least begin to happen, we would realize that it's the truth, the whole truth. Lord, thank you that you are the truth and that the truth, you, sets us free so that whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Thank you so much, Jesus. And Metanatha, Jesus. Jesus, will you come quickly? It's in your name that we ask and pray.